Welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is episode 132 How to Be a More Expressive Flutist with Steve Kujala. Flute 360 is launching two innovative classes to help you thrive in today's climate. Do you find yourself wanting a space for your unique voice, ideas, and offerings to be heard? Unfortunately, in our current times, a lot of in-person opportunities have been lost. Because of this, I am encouraging you to consider digital opportunities for yourself and your business. I am offering two four-week classes titled The Podcasting Musician. Create your music podcast on a low budget to amplify your voice and offerings. In these classes, we will build your podcast from the ground up. Podcasting has been growing steadily for the last 15 years, and it continues to soar even during a pandemic. Remote classes begin on November 3rd and December 15th, 2020. Register today at HeidiKBegay.com slash The Podcasting Musician. See you soon. Steve, good afternoon. Hello, Heidi. Nice to be here. Good afternoon to you. Well, it's afternoon for you, morning for me. So <laughs> good day. Good day to everybody. <laughs> Bonjour. Bonjour. <Yeah. laughs> How is it in California? <laughs> well, it's uh it's probably warm outside. I haven't been outside my uh my my cubicle, <laughs> my 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 self-imposed prison. My COVID prison, but um, I, I think it's going to be a nice day today. But it's uh, it's already a nice day because I'm talking to you, and it's all it's all good. Awesome. Well, same here. My day is that much better because I have Steve Kujala on the line. How cool is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how cool that is, but it's it's cool. It's cool for me. I'm yeah. very very happy to be here. Awesome. Yeah. So thank you so much for carving out time for us. And um, I can't wait to pick your brain. I think we're going to have a really fun, exciting conversation. Good. Yeah. Looking forward to that. My my, my brain is pickable. Okay. Pick away. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so for those who may not know you, I don't know of any flutist who would not know you unless they were living under a rock. But for those of you... <laughs> But for those Lutus out there that may not know you, um, could you describe a little bit about yourself and your musical background? Yeah, I um, was born in Chicago, outside of Chicago, Illinois, and uh, went to uh, went to high school at uh, Nutra West, which at that time we're talking late sixties, early seventies, um, according to some report that came out back then. We were considered the top high school in the country for music education. And this is back in the day when music education was very prevalent and flourishing all over the United States. So the fact that that, that we were number one and my, my parents, to their credit, moved us from Evanston into the Nutria District just uh, so that we could avail ourselves of that music education. My my parents are both musicians. My father, um, as many of your listeners would know, was the uh, principal piccolo in Chicago for 48 years and was a professor of flute at Northwestern for 50 years. Hmm. <laughs> so I kind of inherited my uh, my love of the flute from him and uh, and actually studied with him for most of my um, student years. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. And my mother was a violinist. They both met at Eastman School of Music. And uh, after high school, when I knew that I was uh, destined to be a professional flutist, I had already at that point been playing uh, principal flute in the in the school orchestra, um, lead tenor saxophone in the jazz ensemble. Uh, first bassoon in the uh, symphonic band and guitar, elect electric guitar, 
Farfisa organ, saxophone, and flute in my rock band. <laughs> mm. So I was um, uh, kind of all over the map uh, stylistically and in terms of my equal love and passion for all the different genres. And I did a lot of genre blending and bending back then before I finally uh, knew that I had to settle down to um, to – just, just you know, pick one, Steve. Mm. <laughs> so, when I when I got into Eastman, uh, I picked one, which is the flute and piccolo, uh, to really buckle down and concentrate on my studies um, in the repertory and um, and possibly um, follow in my father's footsteps and uh, become an orchestral flutist and or piccoloist. So, mm. that was that was the the path, but. Mm. Of course, we know that paths change yeah. <laughs> very quickly, left turn, right turn, two steps forward, one step backward, that kind of a thing. And mm. when I got to Eastman, I realized that there was such a invigorating jazz program there. Uh, I think by my second year, they'd even um, came up with the jazz master's program, which they already had, I think, in Indiana, in Bloomington, and I think North Texas State. Um, there might've been a couple of other schools, but, uh, um, so that was attracting a lot of the, the top jazz, uh, uh, faculty and, uh, aspiring students at that point, they were all kind of flocking to Rochester. So there was a real beehive of activity there and I just couldn't resist. I actually, somebody found out. One of the faculty members found out, hey, Kajala plays tenor, <laughs> and he, he he put it down. He's concentrating on flute, and maybe we could, you know, twist his arm and get him to play in one of the bands. So, sure enough, uh, long story short, I ended up playing in the Eastman Jazz Ensemble, which at that time was a, a, one of the more, uh, I guess, uh, successful or popular um, collegiate jazz ensembles so we, we were all playing at the same festivals like in notre dame south bend indiana all the all the usual festivals competing with you know north texas state and indiana and miami at coral gables those were kind of the the top four or five bands and i really took to it uh, so i i very quickly developed a, a sort of a parallel track between my classical studies on the flute and playing jazz saxophone. And in fact, we started a group back then, a sextet, which uh, at the time would have been known as a jazz rock fusion group. Hmm. It's blending, uh, you know, all these different uh, genres and so forth. And uh, that group, which was, uh, we went through several name changes, but it ended up being called Oracle, spelled A-U-R-A-C-L-E. Hmm. And we were really on to something. Uh, we won several contests, went to New York and did a, uh, uh, spent a day at CBS Studios up there doing a demo, which was one of our the prizes for winning a battle of the bands. And uh, we took that demo and kind of ran with it. And through a contact of my father's um, at Northwestern, a guy named uh, Jim, Jimmy or James DePasqual, he was a composer and a woodwind, uh, mainly a saxophone player, but also doubled on flute. And he had some lessons with my dad. And he had already moved out to California to make his way as a composer. So my father put us in touch with uh, Jimmy in Los Angeles. And uh, eventually we, we made our way out there. I left Eastman after my junior year. I took a leave of absence for a year. Hmm. And uh, we headed west. Everybody else in the band was uh, a year or two older than me, uh, except for the trumpet player, uh, Rick Braun, uh, who's a fairly famous name now in the smooth jazz world. Um, he's my good buddy. And he and I were the, were the babies in the band, so we both took a leave of absence, came out to L.A. and gave ourselves a year to land the coveted <laughs> recording contract with one of the major labels, which uh, we finally did within three or four days of that one year mark and uh we did a record called glider on the chrysalis label which interestingly um uh also uh, actually the label was formed by the 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 president of the label uh, uh terry ellis and his partner chris wright 
That's how they came up with the mm. with the name Chrysalis. Chris Ellis. They took the first name of one guy and the last name of the other guy, Chrysalis. Mm. And uh, they had a, some kind of a butterfly logo. But the the big act on that sure. on that label was Jethro Tull. Okay. And just going back for a moment to high school. That rock band that I mentioned, we used to do Jethro Tull covers because this would have been late sixties, early seventies, when Jethro Tull was was riding high, a lot of a lot of big hit albums, Thick as a Brick and Aqualung, and et cetera, et cetera. So I was designated as the um, as the Ian Anderson stand-in for our <laughs> for our group, and uh, and here I was on a label with him. So that was uh, kind of an auspicious debut for me personally. And then many years later. I got to uh, perform with Jethro Tull at Grant Park in, in Chicago for the NFA convention. This would have been 97 or 98 or 99. I can't remember which of those years. Um, so there were like three warm-up acts, myself and, and a couple of other bands. Uh, Jim Walker had a band and Nelson Rangel from Denver. Yeah. And so we were the warm up acts. We each got a 20 minute set or something. And then, uh, and then Jethro Tall took over the rest of the night. So I got to hang with him. And then many, many years later, and this is now four years ago, I had an ill fated project called Flutelandia, hmm. which, uh, which involved, um, 23 flutists from all over the world playing various ethnic flutes and then, uh, featuring our three, uh, big stars, which were uh, Ian Anderson doing the rock flute, mm. uh, Hubert Laws doing the jazz flute, and then uh, Sir James Galway doing the classical flute. So they were mm. kind of our our big stars, and then uh, another 19 or 20 of us that were not quite as well known. <laughs> yeah. But we'd do our specialties and so forth, but we never got off the ground because we couldn't raise the funding for the PBS special. So uh, anyway, I ended up uh, in LA in 76. We did our two Oracle albums. Um, they made a minor splash, had some good reviews, and then we all kind of went our separate ways. And I've been a studio musician uh, ever since, probably starting around 1980. We interrupted uh, for three or four years by my stint with uh, Chick Corea, hmm. the great um, jazz keyboard player and composer. So I did three world tours with him and four records, including a, a duet album called uh, Voyage, which got a Grammy nomination. And uh, then by the time that that was it had kind of uh, um, ended, I was pretty well entrenched in the studios. I was married at a young family and I really needed to just settle down and make a living. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that uh, up until about, well, two or three years ago, I've been gradually uh, semi-retiring myself <laughs> <laughs> um you know in, in in the freelance world uh we, we don't ever really retire formally we just we, we are we we become retired by the business they retire us huh. instead of the other way around uh younger people coming in and and the, the business changing and so forth so i'm sort of in that stage now where i'm morphing into uh different uh, areas of interest hmm including writing a, writing a musical. Wow. Uh, so that's been occupying my, my time for the last um, three years or so. It's a musical based on the Magic Flute by Mozart. So oh, cool. All original songs. We're, we're changing the storyline somewhat, uh, doing some composites of characters and adding some new ones and so forth, having a lot of fun with it. Uh, I'm doing the music, and my musical partner, uh, Terry Deserio, she is doing the uh, lyrics and uh, co-writing the, the book with me. So we're having a lot of fun with that. We're uh, about a third of the way through, and um, at some point we'll start shopping it around and doing some showcases and so forth. So that pretty much brings you up to date. <laughs> wow, that is such a neat project. When do you yeah. think the musical will be released? Oh, in, in about 10 years. <laughs> I, I, I say that tongue in cheek because the, the, there's a whole, I mean, we could spend hours talking about the world of Broadway. Uh, I, and I, I kind of come by this project uh, through the back door because I, I did spend 18 years as the primary flute player at the Pantages Theater here in Hollywood mm. doing all sorts of musicals, including The Lion King and Wicked and... Phantom, they, you know, all the all the big musicals came through, you know, Hollywood on the road, and 
that's where I kind of got the bug. Hey, I think I think I could write one of these because I was already a songwriter and a composer yeah. doing my own albums and so forth. Um, I forgot to mention I did get after Oracle split up and after Chick Corea, I did get signed by CBS to do my first um, solo album, which came out in 1987 uh-huh. called Fresh Flute. And that really kind of launched my my studio career uh, in earnest. And, um, but several of the songs on that album, uh, we have, uh, repurposed and written lyrics for, and they have become, uh, the central themes of our musical. So mm. <laughs> it, it's all inter and intro related. Wow. I, it came you know, full circle for you. It, it really did. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Awesome. Well, the reason I'm giggling at myself is because my listeners know that I love with the whole like 360. I love saying, oh, it yeah. came full circle, but yeah. it really did in your yeah. case. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, speaking of 360, they, you know, back in my day uh, when we were do, uh, getting record deals, you'd get a record deal and then you get a manager and you get an agent and you'd get, uh, you know, the bookings and so forth. And they're all considered separate entities nowadays. Hmm. For the young people out there that are looking to get a, air quotes, record deal, unquote, it's no longer just a record deal. It's called a 360 deal huh. where you, you have a record label, you have the agency, you have uh, your, your booking people, you have merchandising people, and you have advertising people wow. that are all working in concert with each other to uh, – to, to, put you out there and to make you a big star and make a lot of money for a lot of people. But labels can no longer survive by just putting out records. So they need to be involved in all the different aspects of your career. So they create uh, the, these new entities called 360 deals. So that's just kind of where things have ended up in the biz. <laughs> wow. Thanks for sharing that. I did not know that tidbit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Huh. Wow. Just hearing your rich history, of course, we can read your bio online, but there is something very special and magical hearing these highlights from the horse's mouth, you know, and just hearing you, you know, go down memory lane and your father all the way through, you know, countless gigs and recording studio gigs is just really neat to hear that from you. Well, thank you. So is there anything else? Well, you know, even you speaking about, you know, the recording world and now you writing a musical, you're right. We'll have to have you back on for like series 30 and 31 to talk about uh-huh. all of that. Cause that in of itself yeah, is a sure. whole nother, you know, topic. And, it really is. Yeah. yeah. And with your experience yeah. of, you know, 30 plus years in the business, like how amazing for you to relay that information to the younger generation. So that way they can learn yeah. from you. Yeah. Are you wanting to let people know that your podcast may come out or no? Yeah. I mean, it, I, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm creating a new website and the website is going to have lots of different uh, menus that will go, that will link to different places, including a, a, a podcast. This is all going to launch um, on my birthday, January 1st. And, uh, that's sort of the official beginning of what I like to call uh, a Kajala 3.0. <laughs> nice. <laughs> like, like I'm a piece of soft, like I'm software, you know. So <laughs> version 3.0, um, just, you know, version 1.0 was kind of my, my career. Version 1.0 was up through uh, Chikoria and Oracle. And then 2.0 was my studio career, um, which is, I suppose, 25 or 30 years long and then 3.0 is everything that will happen from this point on starting in january you know the interruption of covid um has given me plenty of opportunity to to cogitate and reflect on what i've done up to this point and then sort of recenter myself and recalibrate my uh, ambitions uh, into other areas that that I've been interested in, including the musical. But also, uh, I've been getting into some teaching, mm. which I never really thought I, I never really thought I inherited the teaching gene mm. <laughs> from my father. I, I'm 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 good for uh, for a you know a master class here in a clinic there and a, and a one on one. Occasionally, people will come through town and 
pick my brain. You know, it, it's more of a hang rather than a, a formal for, formal lesson. But I've been doing these. Um, uh, well, we did a uh, the, the California uh, is it a state university system. We do this thing called summer arts, mm. uh, sponsored up in Fresno, and I did one. Uh, it's Rena Urso. She's the the coordinator of it, and I did one two summers or three summers ago. Is it two? We were supposed to do one this last summer. They do it every other year, and uh, it got interrupted by by the pandemic. So we're we're rescheduling that for next summer, and then I am doing another one for um, uh, Redland University of Redlands. Mm. Um, and that that's going to be. Um, uh, that's Sarah Andens. Uh, she's the professor there and she coordinates that. And I, I did that about a year ago. We're going to do that again next year. So I'm, I'm sort of re immersing myself into doing clinics and master classes, And I find it very rewarding, uh, just the, the, the back and forth, the interaction between myself and, and the, uh, and the, and the kids, mm. um, to creating that feedback loop and just, giving them the, the the benefit of my experience and just, you know, laying stuff on them and seeing how they, uh, how they, how they receive the information and what they do with it. Mm. It's all very fascinating to me because I, I fully remember <laughs> when I was in school when I was their age and I was like a sponge just soaking everything up and mm. they they get so much input from so many different sources and I'm just, you know, another one. So yeah. <laughs> just kind of add it to the add it to the list. So at the Peabody Conservatory of the Johns Hopkins University, you will receive the artistic training and career preparation needed to become a 21st century artist. An education that will show you how to not only find opportunities, but to create them and make them your own. For 160 years, Peabody has been focused on excellence and innovation in the performing arts and leading the way in developing artists for a changing world. Peabody is a community that builds on time-tested traditions while pushing the boundaries and creating new standards in music and dance programs. Peabody offers degrees in flute performance at the bachelor's, master's, and doctoral levels, as well as a performer certificate, artist diploma, and graduate performance diploma. Their world-renowned flute faculty includes Marina Piccinini, Erica Peel, and Aaron Goldman. Learn more at peabody.jhu.edu. Nice. So, yeah, you finding this uh, teacher hat, you know, now yeah. at this point in your career um, and adding on the podcast. Um, the reason mm. I brought up the podcast um, uh, just from our talks through Facebook Messenger and I wanted to, yep. you know, create buzz for the listeners out there to, to mm -hmm. look for it um, is that with this teacher hat and now this podcasting hat, right, I think you're going to feel a lot of um, those same teacher rewards through yeah. um, podcasting because the same thing like sharing information and then the feedback sure. I get from listeners it's like oh that's so neat that that actually yeah, yeah, yeah. you know helped them within their journey so hopefully yeah, exactly. you find the yeah. same for you yeah, yeah thank you yeah um, oh cool do you know the name of your podcast I don't know yet but it'll probably be uh, some kind of a pun on my name which I have several <laughs> my my studio is called Kajala Land Oh wow <laughs> and that's kind of a um uh, it's a it's a play on on my last name plus the movie La La Land which I played on Okay and um uh, and then we just we you know so there's that and then I my my email is Kajala Muse um so and uh and then i've I've had other things like the cooge cave that kind of a thing so it'll be some be some kind of a clever um yeah <laughs> play on play on my name and and maybe it, it, it may very well be that that um that it is recommended that i don't do that maybe i do something more specific to what i'm what i'm trying to convey so we'll yeah we'll, yeah we'll cross that bridge when we get to it <laughs> I do like the play on your last name. It's very catchy and I think it'll be good for like marketing. You know, it's, yeah. it's something new Maybe. and it'll catch mm -hmm. the ear. Oh, 
fun. We'll see. We'll see if that works out. <laughs> yeah. But I can't wait already for your listeners and people who tune in to receive that kind of knowledge from your 30 plus years in the career. I mean, no. what a great resource. Yeah. I don't have a lot of other people, of course, that that, that have been uh, my colleagues and friends and so forth that I will, of course, have as guests. Um, kind of, I, I guess that's the standard format now is to have uh, guests coming on and, you know, getting into some specific topics, either, uh, that, that you have in common with them or just getting them to, to tell their story. I, I just, I, and I, I cite and quote these friends of mine at all of the clinics that I've done hmm. as examples of this or that or the other. So it's, yeah. And they're only too willing to, to share their experience and their knowledge too. And it just, I think it helps, uh, younger musicians coming up because it, it is such a tough business, especially now. Mm. I mean, it was tough when I, I came up and the, and the people that were my mentors, they, they will always say, Oh no, it was tougher when, when we were coming up. So it, it, it's always tough, but it, in a, in a different way mm. for every generation coming through, there's just, it changes so much. And the tools and techniques that I use, um, may not be applicable to, somebody just to start starting out. I mean, we've got social media now, we've got Twitter, we've got any uh, number of methods that you can uh, sort of shamelessly promote yourself and, and mm. you're encouraged to do so. It used to be that that was verboten, that mm. that was considered gauche to promote yourself. But now it's really the only way to survive. So yeah. a lot of us old, oldsters are sort of reverting, <laughs> going backwards and say, Hey, I, I can, I can avail myself of of this marketing method and, and that and so forth. And, you know, everybody else is doing it. So may as well jump in. Yeah. <laughs> Times are definitely <laughs> changing and the yep. way we approach it is changing. And so we have to keep up and be adaptable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going back to your background and your rich history, um, you mentioned music bending and, you know, really experimenting with, you know, jazz groups and, you know, the Jethro Tull inspiration. Mm -hmm. Do you find that this is like a really good backbone and foundation that was laid out for, you know, your really neat fretless flute and how um, I find you are an extremely expressive player. And so that's why I wanted you to come on board with this series. Yeah, that is, I mean, I've, I've been doing a lot of thinking about expression and that to me uh, you 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 kind of hit on the key there. My fretless flute technique, which began very 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 organically, and that this I could spend hours talking about the, um, the 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 whole chronology of that. But that is my personal uh, mode of expression. That is how I express myself, mm. and that's for for my music and for the things that I write. They they tend to feature that technique. Mm. Um, and it's not just a, a technique that's that's a gimmick. Although it could be very easily um, sort of bastardized and uh, and and done in a gimmicky way, but I've been very careful to cultivate that technique and and, and in, you know employ it musically as opposed to uh, re, re, you know resorting to gimmickry. So I'm I take a great deal of pride in well the the first song that i wrote for that technique the fretless flute song mm -hmm. <laughs> original title yes yeah. <laughs> um that that kind of really t laid the groundwork and it really told the story and was responsible for everything that followed afterwards uh, including the musical and so forth it's all based on that technique and that melody mm -hmm. that is our uh, light motif for our id fixe Mm -hmm. uh, depending on which uh, which which camp you're coming from, but um, as far as uh, and and this kind of leads us into your topic of expression. You know, when I'm playing in an orchestra or I'm playing in a studio situation for a film or or, or you know any of those kind of things, I have to uh, employ what I call great restraint <laughs> mm. <laughs> to keep myself from bending a note when when my my tendency is to want to do that. So I really have to hold myself back because in, in my IMHO, in my humble opinion, it would give even more expression to whatever line I'm playing if I could just bend a note here or there. Huh. And uh, I've gotten in trouble uh, from doing that just because I, I couldn't contain myself. Yeah. Um, 
and I, I use the word great restraint uh, in quotes because uh, when when we came out here in 1976, my group Oracle, that f- that stu- former student of my father's, uh, Jim De Pasquale, he formed a production company for us called the Great Restraint Music Company. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> because we were all in our early 20s, we were just kids fresh out of school, and and. You, when you're that age, you need to be restrained. <laughs> yeah. Because we had way too much energy and and we're just kind of all over the map. So he had to rein us in and um and so he just came up with that with a, that idea of the great restraint. So when I'm in a musical situation where I am not supposed to uh have my own personality enter into it, I I I, I do have to find ways to be expressive musically, but in context. And I've made a lot of notes um, about that concept, about being expressive within the context uh, that that you find yourself in. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm looking at my notes up here. Well, for instance, uh, we've all seen actors. Now, my my younger daughter is an actor. She got got the BFA. And uh, so I've, I've kind of learned about acting from her uh, going to all of her, her, her plays and her, uh, and, and she's doing a lot of stuff professionally now, but you know, in acting classes, they teach you how to not overact, right? Okay. Not to be too emotive unless, unless the scene calls for it. It's the same in music. You don't want to overplay your hand in certain situations when you're in a studio mm. and you're playing, um, a, a TV show or a film or whatever it is. The, the rule of thumb in the studios is you arrive anonymous and you leave anonymous. Huh. They don't want to hear your personality unless it's a composer that you know and they're writing specifically for you. And that does happen occasionally. I've done close to 600 movies and I, I could count maybe on two hands the ones that really featured me and that I actually got a screen credit for, that kind of a thing. So. Mm. In that case, they, they want you to be you. They're hiring you for you. But in, in 99% of cases, they just want you to be part of the team. Yeah. And there's no I in team. <laughs> yeah. So you have to really know how to how to, how to blend in and how to, how to not call attention to yourself. And one of the ways that, uh, that, that flutists, um, you know, I, I guess I should backtrack a little bit and, and give you my, my explanation or my, or my concept of what what it means to be expressive on the flute or on an instrument. Um, and of course, it, it all has to do with starting with the mechanics. We have dynamics, we have tone color, we have the vibrato, um, the usual things that we're taught as, as students when we're first learning to play whatever instrument we're, we're playing. Um, but I find that flutists tend to rely on their vibrato mm. to be, to be expressive, um, uh, successfully or unsuccessfully. I, I, I think that there are certain schools of thought that, and I won't mention any names, but, but, but certain, you know, um, um, schools of pedagogy that, that teach vibrato as kind of a, a something that is always happening. The, mm-hmm. the on switch is always on. And, um, I, I sort of rebelled against that because I was taking a lot of my cues from, jazz singers and jazz saxophone players and trumpet players where they may start a note without vibrato and Mm. then add it in, you know, organically later on in the note Mm. or not use it at all. Mm. So that in and of itself becomes a form of expression to not express yourself with vibrato. Mm. And I, I, I'll tell you, I, I used to teach at a, um, a summer festival up in uh, Victoria, British Columbia, back in the uh, when was it? Back in the '90s, early '90s, I guess, and uh, mid '90s uh, for five summers. And I tried several experiments with with the kids. I wanted them to each try to play whatever piece they were working on. And I, I think the, the first excerpt that that they had was the. Uh, uh, from uh, Carmen, uh, the, one of the interme- intermezzos. Let's see. Right? That one. Um, and I said, can you play this straight tone without any vibrato at all? 
play it as if you were a clarinet player or a mm. French horn player. And here in America, of course, orchestral horn players and clarinets play without vibrato. Mm. In Europe, they do tend to shimmer a little bit and they'll add some vibrato. That, that's kind of their school, the European school of play. But here, by and large, we don't hear vibrato on the clarinet, other, lest it sound like, uh, like Benny Goodman or something. Mm. So can you play this excerpt without any vibrato straight tone? And I, I gave the example, and then they would, each, each one of them down the line would play it. And boy, I'll tell you, None of them could get through the entire excerpt without sneaking a little vibrato in there somewhere. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's such a de default. It's such a um, uh, in uh, uh, you know such a mechanism yeah. that that we're that that's in our DNA almost from from day one. Um, it almost went onto autopilot. That's what it is. Yeah, and uh, and you know there there are. Uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I love vibrato, and there are some very beautiful, beautiful vibratos. Uh, I, I collect vibratos. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sort of have my my fav, my top twenty people with with vibrato, and they're all different. Okay, and it, it becomes part of, part of your signature. It's it's like your musical uh, fingerprint. Mm. You know, that's that's how that that is your vibrato. You're not trying to sound like this person or that person. You're not trying to invent it. It's just the way it comes out naturally. Yeah, yeah. So when you can use that musically and when, when you can sort of pace yourself, I think it becomes even more expressive when you don't hear it all the time. And then you can kind of, uh, you know, unleash it mm. gradually. Uh, and, and, and sometimes it, what's called for is, is a very intense from the get go kind of vibrato. And other times maybe you want to be more placid, more, um, more tranquil more glassy, more mm -hmm. gossamer. And, uh, uh, I think that, that, you know, a, a good example of, of somebody that, that I like to emulate is uh, the singer called Enya. Okay. You know, you know about Enya, right? The, the Irish singer, she does a lot of, uh, I guess it's the new age is the, is her genre. Mm. And she, she came on with that big hit must've been 20, 25 years ago called Orinoco flow. Okay. And when she, what she does is she stacks her vocals. I mean, tons of overdubs, but there is no vibrato. It's all just her tone, mm -hmm. and it just sits there, and you just it, it envelops you, and you just want to be inside that sound, you mm -hmm. know, and sort of bathe yourself in it. And I I've done similar things on the flute where I'm, well, I, I did this song called Tutti Fluti, which was on my Fresh Flute album. That was 126 tracks of flute. Yeah. And the flute does the the rhythm, the harmonies, and the melodies. And one of the components of that was what I call the the uh, the bed, which was an eight note chord. Uh, the chord changes every bar, but it's eight flutes that are all doubled, and it's just straight tone, just a straight glossy tone. There's no no shimmer. There's no vibrato. It's as if you were playing it on a sample on a keyboard, and you're just holding that that, that chord mm. and you put some reverb on it and it just kind of sits there in the background and you place everything else, all the other components on top of that. So, and that came very natural for me. I didn't have to restrain myself in, in, in trying to keep the, keep that nasty old vibrato away. I just, this is what the sound is going to be. This is what I'm doing. This is how I'm doing it. Okay. So there's a time and a place I think for, for every uh, mode of expression. And I think that the more ways you have of expressing yourself in your, in your musical toolkit, I think the better off you're going to be, especially in a freelance situation where, where you do find yourself in extremes. Okay. You okay. go from one extreme to the other and people will, will call upon you. The, there's one composer, I won't mention his name, but, and I've only worked for him a few times, but Several of my colleagues have told me that that this particular composer is um, is very very finicky. He he sort of micromanages your playing to the point where he will close mic you, <laughs> and he wants you to get a sound that is very similar to what he pre-programmed um, in what what they call the mock-up, where they they do everything with samplers and synths and so forth, so they can play for the director before they get um, greenlit to, okay, we like the score, we like everything you're doing, let's 
let's orchestrate it, score it on, and bring it to the scoring stage. Mm-hmm. And then we'll have the real orchestra play on it. They're so um, into their samples and their mock-ups that they expect the human musicians to sound just like the mock-up. Oh, my goodness. So. If a flute player is all of a sudden playing with expression and playing, no, 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 don't do that. No, that's that's not. No, let me play the demo. Okay, I want you to sound like this. Wow. <laughs> and and it turns out that a lot of what what they want you to sound like is near impossible to do on the flute, particularly when you are close miked. Right. You know, the, the mic is, is in your face, and you're going to hear every little artifact, every little impurity in the sound. It's all going to become magnified and amplified because of that mic normally in a, in a regular studio session we will have we'll have a a, a a a mic for the flute section for the oboe section for the you know and it's maybe 2 3 4 5 feet away sometimes and then you have what they call the deca tree which is three microphones placed over the conductor's podium which then becomes the room sound right where the whole orchestra is blended into the room sound and then they will they will the, the the mixer will take a combination of those uh, the two inputs, the close miking and the room miking. Now, this brings what I just described. Close miking <laughs> gives a whole new definition to close miking because they're right in your face. Yeah. So you find yourself uh, changing head joints and you're changing all this stuff because normally you would not hear, you'd not be aware of these extraneous sounds. But yeah. when you're when you, when somebody is laser focused on you, you're going to hear it all. Uh-huh. And so you have to kind of do this delicate dance of, well, okay, yeah, I'll try. I'll try to play this, you know, high B really soft. And normally you'd want to grab the piccolo and just play it an octave lower on the piccolo. And no, 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 I don't want the piccolo. <laughs> I want the flute, but I want it really, really soft. <laughs> okay, so it becomes very exasperating, and yeah. uh, you know, so the so flutists that are that are uh, you know that have aspirations for a freelance career have to know that you're going to find yourself in a situation like that where you're maybe not, not trained for that. Mm. Um, that's, that's something you kind of have to develop um, the technique for uh, sort of on your own. Mm. Whereas then the next day you're playing in the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra or in the Pasadena Symphony or whatever other freelance orchestra there is, and you're going to play the, 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 the big solo for a Brahms solo or whatever, and you're going to, you're going to, you want to project to the back of the hall mm. and you want to use that beautiful big sound that you've developed over all those years and that luscious vibrato and so forth. Then you can let out all the stops, but you have to be able to change on a dime mm. because it's different every day. And um, some people are more adaptable to that than, than others. And the ones that can adapt to those uh, wildly varying situations are the ones that will you know, find a successful career in in the freelance world. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Oh my goodness, that microphone right up on you. I'm just thinking, mm-hmm. like, no pressure, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. But that's where the practice room comes in, where you get to like explore, right? Like, how Absolutely. soft can I get that high B, and how you know, et cetera, yeah. and all the different extremes. Um, and the thing is that that you don't really know how soft you're getting on the B until until you record it and hear it back. Mm. So I always encourage, uh, in fact, I'm doing a, um, a webinar in a couple of weeks for that summer arts that we're doing in uh, Fresno next, uh, next summer. And uh, Rena wanted me to do a two-hour class on home recording, mm. which I've been doing for 30 years now. And I have a lot of uh, knowledge and experience doing that. So I'm, I've, I've always encouraged uh, the younger people coming up to you know, make yourself a studio. It doesn't have to be elaborate. You don't have to spend a lot of money, but you need to learn how to play to the mic Mm. and with the mic. And you need to learn which microphone to get and where to place it and, uh, and what kind of outboard gear you need and and what kind of dog you're going to use and so forth. So that that I'll be doing a two hour thing on that. But, Mm -hmm. uh, that's so important. Um, if you're going to get into a recording career, because, that's what they use for recording is a microphone. Yeah. Um, so you, you need, you need to learn all about those things and you, you, you'll find yourself on a session where, Oh no, not that microphone. You start to know, you start to get to know the microphones, the AKGs, the 414s, the Neumanns, the, all the different brands and the different types of mics and 
some of the mics are your friends and some of them are your enemies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that is the truth. And, um, I and you only learn that by, by, by doing it and then going into the booth and, and hearing a playback. Ugh, wow. <laughs> do I really sound like that? Yeah. <laughs> and then on the next day you're with another micro. Wow. Yeah. That's what I sound like. So you start to make a mental note of what mics you sound good on or what mics you don't sound good on. Mm. And, um, so there, there you go. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up because my husband and I own a video slash audio um, recording yeah. company, JK Productions. Uh -huh. And I say that because we just did two months ago a series on our virtual flute world. And it was just helps oh, on, yeah, just helping music teachers with their uh, remote teaching and how to record. And the thing that we kept saying yeah. over and over is you have to experiment. Like one, you have to get good equipment, but then you have to know the proper like setup and everything. But uh, not, absolutely. E not yeah. even that, just like getting comfortable um, having a black microphone and the setup and the mic stands and the boom arms all like around you. I mean, yeah. it, it's just right. a different yeah. environment and a different feel. And so if you get into that booth yeah. to record and you haven't been practicing with the equipment, you're going to be a little, mm -hmm. um, you know, you could yeah. have a little performance anxiety, but if you do it, you know, and you practice with it, then it's going to be second nature. Mm hmm. Yeah, they have they have this thing uh, which I'm I'm sure you and Eric both know about uh, called the microphone shootout. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> which is when you're yeah you you you'll you'll have a whole array of mic you you'll rent rent some time at a professional studio and you and you'll you'll come up with five or six mics that you want to try out and you record yourself. Uh, the engineer will, will will put each mic into a different input and on a separate track so that you can A B C D E F them. And hear what you're good on, and you'll eliminate two or three of them right off the bat, and then you'll narrow narrow it down to two or three, and then uh, let the shootout begin. Mm. Uh, and then maybe you'll take, you'll rent or uh, put a deposit on two of them and take them home and try them in your own environment. You come up with the microphone for you, mm. for your sound, for your for your setup, because uh, a lot of people have a certain amount of air in their sound which they can't. Uh, necessarily uh, get rid of. It's just sort of a component, but there are ways to deaccentuate that mm. by by placement, by by not, you know, by, by being off axis and, and not playing directly into the mic. Maybe a little bit more distance, a little bit more air in the room, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. those are things that you end up playing with, and you you learn how to play that mic as if it is an instrument that you need to learn how to play. Yeah. Exactly. Then once you get that, then once you get that down, then you can go on autopilot. Then it, it's no longer an issue. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's an art. There's an art to recording, and there's definitely a science behind mm -hmm. it too. And understanding yeah. the yeah. that world is so important to what we do. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say a little bit more about expression. <clears throat> you know, I came up with this concept. There's a difference between expressing the music through you versus expressing yourself through the music. Okay. And there's a time and a place to, to, for both approaches. But more often than not, you will hear players that, that are using the music, if it's a piece of, of famous repertoire, they'll use the music as a way to express themselves. Mm -hmm. Whereas maybe they should be hewing closer to air quotes, the composer's wishes, even if that composer has been gone for 200 years, yeah. one wonders, okay. And, and, and we receive this, these, this, the sage advice from our teachers who studied with this teacher, who studied with that teacher and it's knowledge that's passed down. There's a certain way you want to play Bach. There's a certain way you want to play Mozart. There's a certain way you want to play, you know, uh, Debussy and uh, Hindemith and Shostakovich. So you, you, on and on and on. But where do you draw the line between your your right to self expression and sort of the um the the expectations put on you by the the tradition of that composer mm. and it's a very fine fine line to walk and um i'm I'm not sure what the answer is to that that's something that i've personally have struggled with for a long time because i I have such a strong personal musical personality. Mm. that going back to what I said before, I have to practice great restraint <laughs> yeah. to, to sort of rein that in and hold it at bay. 
not that I'm going around playing the Poulenc Sonata or the or this and that. I don't really do that anymore. Mm. I, of course, I studied all the the, the repertory as a, as a student and love all of those pieces. I did one recital late in my high school years with a, a, one of my best friends, a piano player who has ended up being an incredible jazz trumpet player and composer and arranger and producer. In fact, he produced my Fresh Flute album for CB- CBS, Okay, did all the orchestrations on it. But he was also a magnificent classical pianist. So <laughs> once I discovered that about him, we, we put together recitals. So we did we did the, uh, the Poulenc, we did the Bartok uh, Hungarian Peasant Suite, we did the, um, the, the Dutuyu, mm. and then I did Syrinx, uh, and then he did the WC Children's Corner Suite. So we each had a solo piece. We had three repertoire pieces, and then we did. We started the recital off with an improvisation for flute and piano. Oh wow! And uh, anyway, so that that uh, was um, an, an ex- a young example of me inserting myself into the music, much to the chagrin of my father, <laughs> where, where we're just, just unbridled youth. We, we just, we went in there and, okay, we're going to do it our way. <laughs> huh. I mean, I had all the recordings. I had the Ron Paul and I had the, the, um, the Kincaid and all, all the, you know, the, the small number of flute players that were on record at that time. Those were kind of my models and as well as hearing my father practice every day and sitting on on his lessons with his students and hearing his recitals. So I kind of had the whole spectrum of, of influence there, but damn it, I wanted to do it my way. Yeah. And that, that got me into trouble later on when I was up at that festival. We, each of the faculty members was uh, required to play a concerto on every Saturday night, concerto night. Mm. Uh, So by, by the end of the, of the session, we uh, had all each played our, our concerto. And one year, I decided to play the uh, the Griffiths poem, which mm-hmm. is very near and dear to my heart, one of my father's favorite pieces. And his teacher, Joseph Mariano, uh, with whom I studied at Eastman for a year before he retired, uh, he had a magnificent recording of the of the poem on Mercury Records with the Eastman the Eastman Rochester Orchestra, who's called back then with Howard Hansen conducting. Mm. And I love that recording so much, just his tone, the, the, the way that he played. And um, that was my model for how to play the poem. Mm. So when they gave me an opportunity to, to, you know, to play a concerto, I, I jumped at the chance. I memorized it. I went up and I played it. And what did I do in the middle of it? You know, the little mini cadenza. Um, yes. Um, in the middle, right? Yes. I kept going and I turned that into a long two and a half minute cadenza where I improvised. Oh, wow. I never let the conductor know I was going to do it ahead of time. Yeah. And I could see him out of the corner of my eye. He, he had his hands up ready to bring in the next section and he's looking at me. He's looking at <laughs> the players of the orchestra. Yeah. And apparently I'm not stopping. So he finally slowly put his arms down to the side yeah. and stood there and, okay, he's off. He's off and running. He's going to do his thing, whatever that is. And and then I, I finally turned I, – I came to the end of the cadenza and he knew that I was ready to to – you know, bring the orchestra in for the next section. And wouldn't you know it, when the reviews came out the next day, mine was the only review that <laughs> – I think they snipped it off at the end. Because <laughs> this is Victoria, British Columbia. They're mm. all retirees up there. They they want their, their music pure. They want yes. it traditional. They, yeah. they don't want anybody monkeying around with it. So, <laughs> um, so I – you know, I was in my early 30s then. I was – but many years later, I, I have to mention this, mm-hmm. when YouTube started coming around, and this would have been, I guess, 2003, 2004, somebody sent me a, a clip, and I'd never heard of YouTube at this point, but somebody sent me this clip of a, a French-Canadian violinist named Gilles Apop. Do you know that name? I do not. Uh, spelled G- uh, G-I-L-L-E-S, Gilles a pop, a a p a p, and he was. This is a recording of of a concert that he gave of the Mozart G major violin concerto, in which he comes up to the cadenza, 
and does the same thing that I did, except he went even farther. He played it in eight different styles. Wow. We had rock, we had bluegrass, we had um, <laughs> Indian, we had, um, you know, rock and roll, we had it just w jazz. I mean, it went all over the place. And you see the, uh, <laughs> the, the, the the camera shot is full on of him, but you can see some of the musicians in the background. They're like the, uh, the principal viola. And a couple of them were just like, yeah, man, wow, that is really cool. And they're just kind of grooving along with them. And then a couple of other people had these sullen, dark looking faces like... <laughs> Like yeah. sacrilege, you have yeah. ruined our Mozart. And yeah. How dare you? Yeah. And at that moment, uh, I could really, I, I, I felt vindicated somehow. Okay. That, that, okay, I'm not the only one that mangled uh, some piece of repertoire. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, mind you, I, I did it tastefully. Right. I used all the themes, I, I, but, but I employed some of my, and in fact, uh, now that I'm thinking of it, I actually did sneak in some of my uh, note bending, da, 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 dee, dee, ah, yeah, yeah, kind of that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and the very ending, uh, dee, da, 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 right with the ending of the low C sharp, I did that all with whistle tones. Oh, wow. I actually have a recording. Of that. They, they did a videotape of all those guys. It'll never see the light of day, but I found it. I hadn't seen it in 25 years. And, uh, I was uh, astounded and also a, a little bit frightened <laughs> and a little embarrassed that that I did that. But you know, youth is youth, and um, I did it. And and so fr from that point on, I, I really had to take that lesson to heart and just remember that people are when you're a professional musician, people are paying you to play their music the way they want it played. Right. You know, and that most often does not include all your all your little techniques and so forth. There are exceptions. There's a, a composer that I did maybe two dozen films for named Thomas Newman. Mm. And all, almost all of his movies started with a lot of small group sessions in a small studio. And he actually wanted us to bring our own personalities to the table. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of whistle tones and a lot of note bending and a lot of other things. Um, and, you know, he wouldn't use all of it. A lot of it would end up, most of it actually would end up on the cutting room floor. But he encouraged us all to experiment and be creative with the canvas that he gave us, which is very, very rare. Mm. Um, and by the time we got to the orchestra sessions, of course, our parts were pretty much already done. They were already on tape. And um, the 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 tutti parts, the ensemble parts, we would just play along with the orchestra. So it's kind of like alter egos. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I found that very productive and very stimulating, and uh, I have very fond memories of all of those movies. So you know, you you do occasionally get a chance to 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 show your stuff. You know. Yeah, I love all of this. What I'm curious about, um, or what I would like to elaborate on and ask you, going back to the cadenza that you improvised for the Griffiths poem, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm so glad you brought up that memory because, um, to me, it showcases, you know, uh, and it piggybacks off beautifully this topic of expression. So what I'm hearing is you felt so passionate about expressing yourself in the moment. Right? Mm -hmm. am, am I hearing that correctly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Um, it's not, yes. it's not that you were being disrespectful in any way, you know, to the music. You. Yeah, I, I, I think my mindset probably at the time was, um, you know, if, if Charles T. Griffiths were, were, were alive now and he knew that a flute could do that, he probably would have written for it. See? Yeah. <laughs> Just like a, fr a friend of mine, uh, Peter Sprague, great jazz guitar player, um, he, he he says this all the time in our concerts live to the to the audience. He'll say, you know, if Bach were alive today, he'd be a jazzer. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. he actually wrote a piece that that starts with a with a with a, a snatch of Bach from something, and then it it goes into an original composition. And when we're playing it, we do some trading of fours, and we do it in the in the in the baroque in the baroque style. We we try to hue as close to that as possible. But, you know, back in that day, they improvised all the time. Right. They, in fact, it, it, it was up until recently, uh, maybe the last 50, 75 years, that you were expected to bring your own cadenza, whether it was 
you know, Baroque or whether it was a, a, a Mozart or whatever it was. I mean, mm -hmm. people back in the day used to yep. do that all the time. Yep. That was de, de rigueur for them. Yeah. Um, but we seem to have lost our way in terms of um, in, in incorporating that, that tradition. But I think more and more people are like Gilles Lepop and me and maybe some other people are, are starting to bring that back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my opinion is not that my opinion matters, but I commend you because I respect that take in the sense of you are just honoring the art of cadenza playing, you, yeah, you, yeah. you know, and that's what you just said. You know, that was the, um, go to for cadenzas. You made mm -hmm. it up, you wrote your own yeah. and you know, you yeah. didn't have it written out mm -hmm. in some edition or some publisher provided it, you know? Uh, so uh, yeah, but that's amazing. So, you know, getting back to, to what I had sort of declared, which is you can either express the music through you or you can express yourself through the music. And it, it all comes down to, I guess, personal taste and personal preference and, um, and being being respectful, mm -hmm. but at the same time being you, because you don't want to play it and sound like somebody else. You want to you want to make it your own. You know, I'm reminded of um, some of our more famous conductors. The one that comes to mind uh, is Lenny uh, mm -hmm. Leonard Bernstein, who, as he got older, became more and more flamboyant on the podium. I, we, we see tons of YouTube videos of him. You know, in his early days, he was he was very demonstratively emotive on the podium, for sure. He's a very passionate fellow. But later on, it just it just kind of got out of control. Hmm. But but the players knew what he wanted and they respected his passion, if not his technique. <laughs> hmm. um, and even though it was over the top, he was able to wring out of them what what he wanted. And uh, I really admired him for that. As opposed to somebody who is more technically oriented, like a Fritz Reiner or a, or a Schulte, just to bring some Chicago people that I that I know very well, um, and then you get everybody in between. Mm. Uh, I I have this book you you may have heard of or have in your collection called The Maestro Myth. Yes. By do you you know that book? Yes. I've I've read that probably three or four times now and. Mm -hmm just the uh the 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 um, descriptions of some of these past conductors from the from the old days Klemper and Fortwangler and you know Zell and all these people it it just you know uh, he has a chapter called the dictators <laughs> right the ones that <laughs> right. just struck fear into your heart you know and Reiner was one of those yeah it makes you think how can anybody perform to their best abilities when when they're in fear of being fired on the spot Right. Because a lot of these conductors were, were, were active when there were no contracts. There was no job security. Mm. And you're, you're only as good as the last note you played or something. And uh, you, boy, mm. you, you, you cross the line and ah, you're out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have so many stories about that, but that's <laughs> another, uh, another topic. Yeah. So. No, but I love this fine line that you're talking about, like respecting yeah. the music and then, you know, yeah. honoring you, the performer and knowing yeah. the context. Oh, you know, I just remembered what I was going to say. The uh, uh, In that same festival, I did another concert at the a church called the Christ Church Cathedral. And I was doing the, uh, uh, the Bach B minor suite with a very small, uh, I think a double string quartet and continuo. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful, you know, very tall, deep church. So there's a lot, tons of like a eight second reverb. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and the sound just gets washed up in there. So I, there's the, 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 the slow movement. I don't remember the theme, but there's a, there's a passage in there that goes, um, starting on a B. Right. So I took it upon myself to go. But I did it in such a way that it didn't call attention to itself. So in other words, it wasn't, do, 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 oh, oh, hey, we're going to be seasick now. Get out the drama meme. <laughs> yeah. It was very, it was very subtle. It was, do, 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 oh, oh, oh. oh nice. almost as if what a violinist would do with the portamenti, you know? Yeah, yeah. Which they do all the time. And for a violinist, it, it, it seems stylistically appropriate uh -huh. in a lot of places. 
So I did that, and I figured nobody's going to even notice because it's all awash in this humongous structure that we're playing in, and nobody's going to really know or, or mind. And apparently yeah. nobody did. But I, I, I feel like I kind of I, I played what I felt, but I also got away with it. Okay. Because it, <laughs> because I could. Yeah. <laughs> and they also uh, there's this um, uh, baroque technique. Um, it's a French technique known as, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong, flatmont. Yes. You know okay. Flatmont. Yes. So what I did, I did my version of a flatmont, where I, uh, with the open hold flute, I was going to do a, vi- a f- what I call a fingered vibrato. Mm-hmm. So I'm playing an E. And instead of doing the uh, our diaphragm or throat throat vibrato, I'm lifting my E key finger, the, the middle finger, mm-hmm. and I'm lifting it slightly off the key, but without the 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 mechanical key rising up. So I'm just exposing the the open hole and then closing it, exposing, opening, closing. Mm. The, it makes a kind of a shimmer effect. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of a, a sort of like a quarter tone vibrato. Hard to describe. I, I I could grab my flute, but I th- I think the levels would be <laughs> mismatched for for this experiment here on the podcast. But anyway, that I, I did that a lot, and I didn't even know that there that, that it had a name until years later. I was reading huh. some scholarly publication, and I learned about flat won't. Yeah. And I said, oh, hey, that's that's what I would do on the E or on uh, any any note that had uh, an exposed hole on the key that that I could sort of do that fingered technique on. Uh-huh. Um, so that I thought that was kind of cool. And it I thought it was um, in context, and I thought it was tasteful, and yeah. there you go. So yeah. just another example of of trying to be tasteful but original. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I love that. And that's what the earlier flutist did with the traversal flute for vibrato. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, that must have been where I was reading it. And I don't remember whose book it was. Maybe a Quants, a J.J. Quants or some, oh, one of sure. those. I think, it was a, I think it was one of the books on my dad's bookshelf. I just kind of, hey, this looks like an interesting title. I'll grab this and, mm. you know, yeah. sponge up some, uh, some, some knowledge there and whatnot. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. I had a really great semester with uh, Dr. Kim Pineda, who is a Traverso player. And that's where ah. I, that's where I learned that from. And so anybody who wants to find a resource, check out Dr. Kim Pineda's resources. He's wonderful. Wonderful. Wow. Now, now, is is it true that they? I mean, I, I hear these period uh, ensembles. They are examples very often of playing without vibrato. Yes, I believe so. Is this, yeah, is that kind of traditional for that? I mean, I'm I'm no expert on that on that idiom but yeah um, i am not an expert either i just took like three months with, <laughs> with dr Pineda, uh, so i don't want to put my foot in my mouth and um get yeah. get myself in trouble but um he was talking about different ways to produce the vibrato you know just the normal sure what, you know yeah. what we do with our throat right. and our vocal cords yeah. and but then just that um the finger vibrato too that was yeah. a technique and yeah. but yeah i'm sure quants is what you're thinking of um in <laughs> terms of and, you know i yeah I um I heard a recording recent well maybe a year or so ago, um and I can't remember if this came out as a set or if it was just one sonata but uh, Emmanuel Pahud mm. did a one of the box sonatas without vibrato, mm. and I thought that was so cool mm. because he has such a, a a a beautiful thick dark sound anyway yeah. That he he doesn't really need to add any vibrato, and, and and even when he does vibrato, it's not it's not an over the it's never an over the top vibrato. It's always very sort of contained, you know. Yeah. It it adds a shimmer to the sound as opposed to pulling you into it and you know being in in, in your face. I'm gonna I'm gonna you know smash you over the head with vibrato. <laughs> you know, just, you know, it's always very tastefully done, yeah. which I've always appreciated because it's so different than. You know a lot of other um, flutists of our of our day. Yeah. So, but but to to have the um, the not sure what used to, what word to use on the on the podcast, but to have um, you know just just to be able to to go out there and hey, I'm going to play this without vibrato. That's uh, yeah. That's pretty. That's a pretty pretty bold move. Gutsy. I, <laughs> I'll 
was a pretty, I was a very big fan of his from that, from that point on. Not that I wasn't already, but right. just showed, showed another side of him. Yeah. He does have a very pure sound and I agree, mm -hmm. you know, like he didn't even really need the vibrato cause his, he's so expressive yeah. and there's so many colors in his yeah. sound anyways. Oh yeah. 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 Very cool. So you've mentioned, you know, your Canadian violinist friend and these jazz singers mm -hmm. and Pahood. What no. are some other like artists and they don't have to be musicians per se. What mm -hmm. other artists are you inspired, you know, through their expression well, uh, uh, in their yeah, works? Yeah. Yeah. I have a little list here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, there's a, a, a young guy on the scene now. He's not a flutist. Although I'm sure if he picked one up, he could probably play it. Uh, his name is Jacob Collier. Do you know that name? I do not. He's probably in his mid twenties now. He start. He's a, a, a British, a British fellow, and uh, he was born into a musical. Well, I think his mother was a pianist and/or singer, and his father was some kind of a, um, like a doctor or a lawyer, something not musical. But he he was brought up in a in a very um, enriched family. And he started out as what we call a bedroom artist, meaning he would do these little YouTube videos in his, in his, um, in his bedroom with all of his, his gear, you know, mm. laptop and keyboard and whatever else he had. And these, these videos started getting a lot of hits and he was getting up into the hundreds of thousands. And then finally, um, I, came across him live at the NAM convention. Do you know about the NAM convention? I do. That they have every year. Um, so this is the one in, in Anaheim. And I was going to a booth, um, which I do every year. I, I, I always make the pilgrimage to my uh, <clears throat> Motu booth, Mark of the Unicorn, which is my software, my DAW software, <laughs> uh, to see the latest updates and so forth. And they usually have somebody there demonstrating playing on a keyboard or something while the while the moderator is uh, is showing on the screen what they're doing and they had this young kid come in who had a scarf around his neck and kind of mm -hmm. hippy dippy looking I thought oh this is this this should be interesting mm -hmm. and he came up and he played this amazing stuff and I was sitting next to a, a colleague of mine a, a keyboard player and I said my god Alex who is that or Alan is Alan Steinberger and Alan said you don't know who that is I said no I said, that's Jacob Collier. I said, really? Huh. And I was mesmerized for the whole 20 minute set that he played, doing all these uh, stuff, uh, vocal things through a, through a vocoder and um, and all these keyboard things and uh, just amazing arrangements of um, various uh, standards and so forth. And I immediately looked him up when I got home and he had tons of videos out there. And now this is six seven years later he's got millions of of hits on his um on his youtube videos and he's been a uh, guest soloing with orchestras all over the world mm. he's been doing master classes and at cambridge and at mit mm. he's and he's in his early 20s wow and he's holding court like a like a, a learned professor and he's got all these wild ideas of of um of harmony and uh, but so please uh have your listeners if they're not all already aware of him uh, uh check him out jacob collier okay he's one to, one to keep your eye on um and then i'm reading a book right now by a cellist named uh janos Sh janos starker okay do you remember him at all he he a hungarian cellist uh that <clears throat> taught at um he taught at IU uh, uh, in Bloomington for, I guess, probably 35 or 40 years. He used to be the principal cellist in the Chicago Symphony uh, back in the Reiner years. Uh, when my father mm -hmm. came into the orchestra, he was the prin principal cello at that time. And then he and a bunch of other people from the CSO got wooed to come to, to Indiana and, and be on the faculty there. They were building... Uh, what turned out to be uh, one of the top five music schools in the country now. But back then it was kind of fledgling and uh, in, in its infancy stages, but they got a lot of great people to come there. And I'm reading his biography now. I think he died 10 or 15 years ago, but it's a great memoir. And uh, I've learned a lot. Of, I, I, I love reading biographies of musicians and composers. Uh, I have a whole bookcase full of them. 
and my mother who lives in uh, outside of Philadelphia, and of course my father who's in uh, in Evanston, and they both have these amazing bookcases. My father all the flute books, and my mother has all the violin books, and <laughs> wow. I just love love reading about whatever I can get my hands on. It just it always. There's always an aha moment, and they're all, all doggy or one of the one of the pages, or I'll take a picture of mm. that page on my iPhone, or I'll write something down and just add it to my collection of pearls of wisdom. Yeah. And then I then there's another book that I've read uh, reread recently because they came out with an abridged edition, and this doesn't pertain specifically to music or to expression, our topic for the day, but it's called The Long Tale by okay. Chris Anderson, and it's all about the, the entertainment business or the music business and what has happened to um, to the biz over the last 15, 20 years with the advent of, uh, of social media and so forth. And he has this, this expression, which I can quote directly. It's called the democratization of the tools of production, which basically in a nutshell means that we don't, we no longer are beholden to the major uh, uh, record labels and their uh, multi-million dollar studios to record our records in. Yep. We can now do all of that on our laptops and our our home setups. You can make a a, a, a recording and put it on on a live streaming or a CD or whatever whatever mode you're going to put it out in, and it will sound every bit as good as something produced in a in a major studio. Yep. Uh, as can. Uh, videographers, they can put out their movies, as can uh, people that are going to um, do SOP, so, you know, or a P, uh, POD, publish on demand. If you're writing a book, uh, <clears throat> it's it's wide open now. Mm. And the long tail refers to a graph where you have the the the, the left, so the the vertical part of the graph is where people are selling, you know, the Taylor Swifts, right? The, the people are selling millions of records yeah. and movies that are, that are doing 150 million in gross sales. That, and the, the books are at the top of the New York times booksellers. And then the other side of the tail is the one that, that goes down as a parabolic arc and it disappears into infinity. <laughs> and the farther you go along that tail, you find the people that are putting out their own things on the internet and they may sell five or 10 books or records or movies or whatever it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. And then you have everything in between. But because we are no longer brick and mortar, yep. we, we have eliminated the need to put out physical product. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that has um, uh, eliminated all of that, of the, 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 the uh, barrier to entry, as they call it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so any, anybody can publish anything. Now, a uh, concomitant with that is the fact that, that you have a lot of garbage that comes out too. That's true. But it also bring, brings out these bedroom artists like Jacob Collier and, and other people like him that, that just, just magically appear out of their bedrooms and onto the world stage. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's it's pretty amazing what uh, these these very talented and homegrown musicians, some of whom have never had a lesson yeah. on their respective instruments, they just do what they do. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, so so that long tail is is, is, a, is a good book to have in in your arsenal as you as you come out of school and you're mm -hmm. gonna um, thrust yourself onto the on, into the world and make your way. It's it's good to have in the in the toolkit, I think, for a perspective on that. Yeah, I can't wait to check it out. And you're right, like with software and technology and all of this equipment, it's so accessible to us. Oh, right? yeah. You oh, know, yeah. and so, and I think with that accessibility is really amazing because then you're right, these bedroom artists, um, their voice is getting to be heard. And yeah. in, uh, you know, normal circumstances, maybe, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, maybe that voice would not have aired or been featured um, absolutely, absolutely. I think that's yeah, amazing. Because, but, yeah, because back in the day, they used to have um, what they termed vanity vanity press. Okay. Which meant that if you didn't, if you weren't good enough to get a recording contract, you could always hire a local company to 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 press a disc for you. You you make your tape and you put it out on a disc, and there's my record. But it's not one of the major labels that heard you in a club or heard you in a concert and we're going to sign this artist. We're going to make you famous and we're going to have you tour all over the world. It's for the, the, the people that weren't quite good enough to get 
to, to do that. Now you've got millions of them mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. that are just doing their own thing. And it, it's either good or it's not good, um, and that's that, that's in the eyes of the beholder. I mean, yeah. it's all subjective, and and the, the the internet has a way of weeding out and separating the the, the wheat from the chaff, as it were. Mm. Um, so the cream the cream always rises to the top, and we always eventually become aware. If if you're that good, you're going to make your mark, and you're gonna you're gonna make a splash somewhere. So mm. yeah, then you know, then other people don't don't have any aspirations of being a solo artist or a creator at all. They just want to be part of the team, in which case then you're going to be a freelancer. You're going to be a, um, a teacher at a university, or you're going to get that orchestra job or whatever it is. And at that point, you're pretty much just, you're, you're one of the minions. You're, you're one of the worker, worker bees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I remember, I remember, uh, Galway in, in one of his earlier books, he said, um, that when he left, uh, just before he left Berlin to, to, embark on a solo career. I, this is not an exact quote, but, but the gist of it was that he, he didn't want to be the oarsman anymore anymore. He wanted to be the captain of his ship. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he didn't want to be slogging it out year after year, playing the same repertoire over and over again, because he knew that he had that innate fire in his belly of wanting to be a soloist. And he, he made the transition and Came to Eastman, uh, parked himself there for a semester. I studied with him for six or seven lessons, and then poof, his uh, his uh, solo career launched, and the rest is history. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, and and other people do it in other ways. I, I don't know that that we can ever make a uh, a star of that magnitude in that way again. Sure. Um. He came up at, at a certain time and there were certain things available to him in terms of marketing promotion and so forth. The Johnny Carson show, the, the, the you know, the Sesame Street appearances. <laughs> I was just going to say, I was just going to say Sesame Street. Know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he's, he's got this uh, amazing personality, which, which is uh, just so cheerful and uh, endearing and charming. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you know, you, you, you bottle that. I mean, can you bottle that? Capture yeah. that lightning in a in a bottle? Uh, not everybody has that. And yeah. I was reading another, uh, or maybe I, I heard a um, who was it? Uh, a friend of mine sent me a interview with somebody. It might have been it might have been Starker. Okay. Um, an interview. Um, who was explaining the difference between a professional musician and an artist. Okay. Somebody who's going to go out and have a solo career and they're, they're, well, if you're going to be an artist, you have to have these six components, you know, I don't remember specifically what they were. I mean, you had all the mechanics, you had a great sound, great intonation, great technique, great this, great that. Those are the fundamentals. Of course, you have to have those. And there are many, many, many people that have that. But what you need over and above that to be an artist is you need to have a charisma. You need to have charm. You need to 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 know how to um, uh, work with people. You need to know how to uh, promote yourself. All the all the, the the je ne sais quoi. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all the intangibles, all the things that that you're either born with or you're not. And that's going to make the difference between whether if you're a violinist, you're going to be just a, a section player in an orchestra and a teacher, or you're going to be a concert master of a one of the top orchestras, or if you're going to, you know, take the plunge and leave the orchestra and embark on a solo career. Do you, yeah. do you have all of the, I think he, he identified 15 different components of what you need in order to be an, an artist mm. working on your own as a, as a soloist is a very, very tough, um, tough road to hoe. And, and, you know, Galway has several books out now, man with a golden flute, I think came out four or five years ago. That's a great read, mm -hmm. and that's that's very telling in terms of how he established his career and, and many other many other books um, by other artists that, that kind of show the way. There, if, if if that's something that you really want to do, mm -hmm. then you kind of have to more or less follow that blueprint, but then add your own um, detours and embellishments uh, along the way. So. Yeah. yeah. 
No, and I love how you're saying, um, do you have that, you know, special star element to be, Mm -hmm. you know, like a Joshua Bell or to be a section leader? What reminds me of that is like Steven Tyler from Aerosmith. I mean, I can't imagine him being just a section or a backup guitarist. (laughs) No, he's he's, he's way, yeah, I mean, he's he's way too um, identifiable and he's very unique. Yeah. And he's flamboyant and he's a, he's a rocker. I mean, he's yeah. just, he's got a, a very unique style of, of singing. And, uh, you know, I, you just reminded me, I was going to, um, blather on about, <laughs> about Ian Anderson with Jethro Tull. He's, yeah. as, as we know, he's, um, he's a rock flutist yep. and a singer and a guitar player and a songwriter and a producer. He's got, he's the whole package. Yeah. And, by his own admission, um, he's he's not what we would call a classically trained um, flutist. I mean, he kind of came mm-hmm. about that, if I recall from one of his interviews, he sort of came about the flute almost accidentally. I think he found it in a pawn shop, and I'm paraphrasing here, but, oh, this looks cool. Maybe we'll add this to the act. And he started playing it, and he got a certain kind of sound out of it, and he was humming into it, and that was – his musical fingerprint on that flute. Hmm. And, but that in combination with a very identifiable kind of voice, a singing voice that he had kind of a very edgy sort of uh, voice and the style of music that he was writing, which um, we now call prog rock or progressive rock. I don't know what they called it back in the day. I don't know that they had a, a label, but um, you know, just that, that, combination of elements created this amazing artist Mm. and he uh, i don't know if you've you've had a chance to hear interviews with him but he is an extremely articulate english gentleman uh talking about his music and his career and life and philosophy and so forth it's he's there are a bunch of interviews with him on YouTube. I highly recommend uh, just to get a, another perspective. And he's very good friends with uh, with Jimmy Galway. Mm. Um, they're they're good buddies, even though they come from different worlds. They just they just love being with each other and interacting, mm. and you know, hoisting a couple of pints, you know. And yeah, just, yeah. It's, it's very cool that the, the the two people from you know two different ends of the of the music biz can find commonality there. I find that. Huh. Really inspire, inspiring. Yeah, there's music right there, right? This universal mm-hmm. language, yeah, and even though it's a different, you know, they're speaking yeah. two different languages. Well, they, there's still this commonality of this is my passion, mm-hmm. and this is what I love doing, yeah. and they respect that. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Very cool. So, Steve. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for these insights <laughs> and just. Well, you're welcome. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I'm going to have to listen to this like two, three, four times because there's so much information and I cannot wait for the listeners to hear this wonderful <laughs> episode. My pleasure to be here, Heidi. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you reached out and I uh, hope uh, a few things that I've said are, are useful to a few people. <laughs> oh, <laughs> definitely. Ask for more, right? Right, exactly. No, you're amazing and you have a wonderful day. Thanks so much, Heidi. You too. Bye-bye. Today's sponsor is brought to you by J&K Productions. Did you know that not only are they a production company for podcasts, but they are a recording company for musicians? Any musical recording needs that you may have J&K Productions can fulfill that need. They have all the necessary equipment and expertise to record your next flute recording for college or graduate auditions, competitions, summer festivals, or a flute album. J&K Productions can record any setup imaginable from solo flute, small chamber, flute and piano, and much more. Consider J&K Productions for your next recording project. Contact them at jkproductions.media. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. For more information, please visit HeidiKBegay.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review in the iTunes store. Let's talk about flute.